Okay, so to get you guys started, um, kind of raise an interest in what our topic's all about, we're gonna give you each, kind of like the last group did, each group a different scenario. And we want you guys to look at those questions on the board. Um, if you were a teacher or coach, would you think these codes are reasonable at your place of employment? Um, and do you think they're constitutional? So read through them amongst yourselves and kind of discuss that, that question. on the board, I'm sorry. Oh. Sorry, we put it on the board. We're just If you want to skip through that, I know that's a long one. Mm -hmm. No, that's just, do you, from what you know right now, just in general, think that's a reasonable dress code? Um, So what do we think if you're a teacher or a coach so far? Just skimming through it. What do you guys think? What's your group thing? We're kind of divided. Divided, okay. Are you going to share what the, what the dress code is? Oh, um, ours is the athletic code. And it says, in order to enhance the spirit of Spirit of the team. Oh, okay. Prevent adverse public reaction. Prevent dissension on teams and for the general welfare of teams and participants. The following regulations governing dress and grooming for pupils participating in and traveling to and from interscholastic activities are in effect. Whenever eating and not traveling in team uniform, male athletes shall wear a jacket and tie. For males, hair must be cut tapered in the back and on the sides of the head with no hair over the collar. Sideburns must be no lower than the earlobe and trim. Males must be clean shaven and not wear beards and mustaches. Females, when not traveling in team uniform, shall wear skirts, no slacks or shorts, and cleanliness and neatness shall be maintained at all times. I hate the reason we're divided is because some of us went to schools where this was code and this was just what we did, and then others of us didn't, and then think this is. So now as a future teacher, what do you think? Do you think this is a fair? Well, and something <coughs> special about that is that's an athletic code. That's not for the rest of the student body. That's only for people participating. So in as a coach, do you think that's a fair? As a coach in, in that case? Um, as a coach, I don't agree with it. Um, <laughs> okay. Because our girls will travel in warm-ups. Um, we're traveling on a bus. We're traveling on an airplane. But um, you're allowed to travel. You're allowed it says if you're not so traveling in team uniform, you have to. You, yes, if you're team if you're uniform, you're going out as dinner. Then you have to be dressed. No, it's on. Females, females when not traveling in team uniform, shower skirts. Like a team uniform to me is their jersey. Uh, well, then uh, I. I'm saying mean, like if everybody has like breakers. windbreakers oh. that they go like traveling, and everybody's got like. So that was our next question. If would your would your opinion change if you were an athlete? Yeah. Would your would your opinion differ between coach and athlete in that co if that's an athletic case or an athletic code? All right, show of hands. How many people think this is a reasonable expectation for dress code? And how many think this is not a reasonable expectation? Okay, just one. Okay, mm -hmm. and that's an actual one that we'll visit in one of our cases. So that's what, to what my what question they, is: What if they don't have the money to purchase? I mean. They don't have the funds to purchase those kind of things to travel with that they're requiring. A jacket as a family. A jacket, a tie. And I think honestly, if they, if, as far as the male side is concerned, if they want to wear a beard, I mean, if they want to wear a beard, if they want to wear their hair how they want to wear it, I believe that they should, they should be able to wear it how they want to wear it. Now, if it gets to a point where it's out of control, to where they have like you know, hair down to their back and stuff. I, I mean, that's a different story, but as far as like clean cut and grooming goes, I mean, I believe that's up to the, that's up to the player. I, don't, I just don't agree with it at all. Okay, 
We're, so we're going to talk about some of these spaces. Um, Yvette? Um, like what Robin said, what they can afford, you know, right. whatever. Well, I know like some schools give a collared shirt, you know, a certain collar that has like the school symbol and the mascot on there, and they wear it with the khakis, which I think is totally fine, you know, but I understand what she's coming from. Right. Bentley? Okay, I disagree with her about the beard stuff. Okay. Just because, and I understand that you can look professional and, and have facial hair, but I think what they're trying to, just trying to look look better and saying like, okay, if you're, if you're all scruffy and you haven't shaved in three weeks, then obviously like, you don't look professional. Right. And um, I mean, John Wooden, if anybody knows who that is, he, as a coach, he never allowed anybody to have facial hair or even have long hair. I mean, he was very specific and I think that um, he knew what he was doing, and so I think it's a good idea. Okay, these are good opinions right now. We're we are going to get into what the law says about certain things, but Andrea, do you want to touch on just maybe a, a couple brief points? I know you guys had a long one. Um, I'll just do accessible bottoms. Okay. Ours is the general school code. It says jeans, quote unquote, darker khaki style pants, dress pants, complete length pants, shorts, skirts, and skirts are acceptable with the following conditions. Um, all bottoms must be securely fastened around the waist. Their size appropriate, worn with a belt if they have belt loops. Um, shorts and shorts, sports, and skirts must be at knee length when standing, uh, so should not be higher than two inches above the knee. Um, are not so long as to drag on the floor and do not have holes or lips. Okay, do you guys, for a general dress code, is that acceptable or constitutional, do you believe? Yeah. I think so for school because, you know, otherwise if, it, if the shorts are too short, it distracts from learning and, yeah. you know. As a student, do you perfect. agree if you were the student and these were I mean, rules? I never, I never had a problem with it, so yeah, okay. I would agree with that. Okay. Was there a question on this side? I saw a hand go up earlier. Okay. okay. And you guys, if you, was kind of just hair. Hair? Well, we okay. Got our okay. Okay. Yeah, you're We don't know what that one is. It's grooming. It's like the it, said it was a general school code, and it's not just athletics, but for this the, is the, the general boys grooming. had to, um, yeah. it says hair may be blocked, but it's not to hang over the ears or the top of the collar of a standard dress shirt. It must not obstruct vision. And it can't be put in a ponytail, a bun, or a comb, or a strap. So, and it just said cleanliness of body and clothing is expected of students at all times. And did you all agree with that? I know you commented on this. As an elementary school, yeah. if that was an elementary school, lots of times our kid, my, some of my kids come to school and they haven't bathed and, you know, their hair is really oily. Um, Sometimes I can't help that. But I know, that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah. I don't know if you can put that as, a, yeah. as part of the school code. So maybe in a younger school. They can't. I mean, some of them do do it themselves, but lots of them can't help it. So. Okay. And the vision thing sounds like maybe a safety issue they need to be able to see where they're going. So I would think that's reasonable. Right. But okay. not being it, not, is it not, not pulling your hair back. They can't pull their hair back. Uh -huh. on. I don't think that's reasonable because well, it can't be long. Start, and if it is long, start you sweating. You want to pull your hair off of you. Know? Well, it's for boys. This is for guys. Oh, I didn't think that's right. and It's pretty much saying that boys can't have hair long enough to even be pulled back. Yeah. And what what decision did that group make on that being reasonable? Kind of what we didn't what? really think that was too reasonable. Okay. Not for the whole school, like athletics. There's just a little different, maybe, but for the whole school, I think. You Okay. 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 So we'll Thank you those. for you guys' opinions. That was a good. Okay. So just as some background information, we're going to go over some of the laws that are applicable. Um, the first is the First Amendment. Um, we're all pretty familiar with this, but just to recap, it prohibits the making of any law that um, respecting an establishment of, of religion or the expression of that religion. Um, infringing on the freedom of speech, the freedom of the press, um, the right to peaceably assemble, and the banning um, of petition for a governmental redress of grievances. So the ones that we're going to be dealing with most in our presentation today are freedom of speech. Um, and then we thought that this was kind of a clever picture because obviously it's for everyone. Okay. And then we get to the 14th Amendment. That's also a lot of 
a large claim that's brought up in a lot of these cases when someone uh, files suit against a dress code or says it's unconstitutional, they pull the 14th Amendment card, if you will. Um, the 14th Amendment um, was stemmed from the Civil War, obviously, the end of the Civil War, the emancipation of slave, um, defining now what an actual citizen means to be a citizen of the United States. You either have to be born or naturalized, which means if you're an immigrant, you have to go through all those processes. Um, and naturalization being that all the um, individuals who were previously slaves now became citizens. So their freedom, their emancipation. Um, it also states that a citizen has privileges, immunities, rights to live life, liberty, and property. Um, and then all these rights cannot be taken away without due process of the law. So someone can't, a government official can't just come and take all your stuff with no, um, you know, no trial, no type of anything to let you defend yourself, even if you've committed some kind of crime. Um, the government may not deny any equal, or may not deny you equal protection um, under the law, which is a, I'll get into both of those, due process and equal protection. And then the rest of the 14th Amendment dealt with other Civil War issues about um, reparations and monetary damages for the war and stuff. All right, due process. Due process um, talks about your fundamental rights. It states that, it, states that it, it covers that states can regulate under narrowly defined circumstances. So if your school or your state school board has a rule um, or dress code, if it's narrowly defined, it's within their rights to say, like they, they can say that, they can, they, their code will hold up. It's not, you know, you can't claim due process if it's narrowly stated. And then um, obviously you're entitled to the whole procedurals of going to a hearing before you get rights revoked. And I thought this was interesting, it says even expulsion from school, and that's what we'll obviously see um, when you don't meet the dress codes, suspension is going to be your punishment. So that's a lot what the uh, plaintiffs are going to claim. And then equal protection clause um, under the 14th Amendment um, obviously started out um, in this back when um, uh, blacks and white were still segregated. So they tried to say, okay, we're going to make it separate but equal, which in saying, okay, if there's a facility down the road where only whites are allowed, then there has to be a, the same type of facility in another place where blacks are allowed to go. So um, that didn't work, obviously. <laughs> People, you know, it finally got back to the court saying, um, yeah, it's definitely not fair. It, you know, they're saying, you know, it's all well and good, it's a good thought, but it's not really happening. And so then you get into the whole desegregation of schools, um, busing black students to white schools to you know, mix and match, and then um, today it's become more of a, um, we're seeing issues now with homosexual rights, abortion issues, does a female have the right to her own body, is that equal if they're saying she can't, you know, um, make the decision to abort a fetus and whatnot. And it also touches on, um, like with our athletic code, the group and team camaraderie. Um, team membership, you can't be treated differently just because of what kind of group you're involved with. Okay, so our first case. This case doesn't necessarily have to do with dress code or grooming, but it set a large precedent for determining what is constitutional. Um, U.S. vs. O'Brien, obviously, they considered it a crime to burn your draft card. That's obviously a pretty big deal if they said, um, here you go, you're going to war now, um, and then they burn it. That was obviously a large government issue. Um, what the precedent set was referred to now as the O'Brien test, and so when cases would refer back to it, they would look at these four points and say, is the dress code authorized under state law? Is, does it advance an important government interest? Is it not related to the suppression of free expression? And only incidentally does it restrict free expression. So um, a lot of our cases, um, or a lot of these dress code cases refer back to the O'Brien test and is it constitutional. 
under these four, and these four things will come up and, and be said in different ways throughout this presentation. So our first large case that has made quite a point is the Tinker versus Des Moines Independent Community School District. And it was in 1965, um, three students, their parents got together, um, parents of Eckhart and Tinker, uh, they decided to express their opposition to the war in Vietnam. Don't know what the background story is behind it. Maybe they had a brother or a family member that got shipped out. And they were just peacefully objecting by wearing black armbands um, between December and fasting between December 16th, 1965 and New Year's Day of that following year, so 1966. So it was during the Christmas break, I guess you'd say, the holiday season. Um, I do not know what school days were in session for these or which, but they obviously went to school on the 16th and 17th, were suspended until they either stopped wearing the armbands or, you know, whatever. Um, the principals enacted a policy two days previously on December 14th because they heard it, you know, talk got around, they heard that they were going to do this and wear these armbands. However, um, there was no fights, no picketing. It was three students that wore it. There was no, um, you know, no violence committed. It was very peaceful. They just wore the army. So when it made it to court, in the district court, they dismissed it on the grounds that it disturbed the environment. So that's, I don't know if we've gotten into this yet, but back to the O'Brien test, does it, um, Is it an important governmental interest? I mean, I think so. It, the, the, the country was at war, but at the same time, it didn't really, it didn't really go there with that. Um, it goes to, obviously, Tinker Appeals. They go, to the Eighth, or they go to the Eighth Circuit Appellate Court, and then on the bench, and bonk, on bonk, um, the judges are equally divided, so they're both split. They have two that say, um, I affirm what the district court says. They have two that say I dissented. So they um, were granted the request to go to the Supreme Court, and then the Supre Supreme Court reversed and remanded it, saying um, this is actually a very um, popular quote from this case, that teachers and students do not shed their, their rights at the schoolhouse gate. You don't go into a school and then all your rights are you know, left you know, behind you have to still respect a student's right even in school. Um, and even though school is a unique setting and you do have to think about the rights of others, um, you still have to you still have to respect the rights of the students. So um, they said that the students were in, within their rights of peer speech and it was separate from disruptive content. They didn't cause a problem. And then I had an interesting um, little sub note from the case. Um, it says, the classroom is peculiarly the marketplace of ideas. The nation's future depends upon leaders trained through wide exposure to that robust exchange of ideas which discovers truth out of a multitude of tongues rather than through any kind of authoritative selection. So I liked that in saying that our country is kind of founded upon you know, having your own voice. You shouldn't, it shouldn't be stifled. And unfortunately, in some cases, can't just go and say, oh, you can't say that and stuff because, um, and I, that's why the, all these laws were put in place and all these amendments were written. So our next case is Bethel versus school district number 403 and versus Frazier in Washington State. Um, this is not about a dress code, but a lot of, it set a lot of precedent and um, all of that it involved. During a, a school election, a peer was nominating his friend, and he uses very elaborate, graphic, and explicit sexual metaphors. So he had mentioned priorly to two other teachers a couple days before the speech, whenever the assembly, I'm going to give the speech, and this is what I'm going to say. And the teacher said, well, that's inappropriate, and you're going to be suspended, or you're going to have consequences for it. Um, after he gave the speech, he was suspended for originally three days, but they only made him serve two, and they allowed him to come back on the third day. And then he was also removed from the graduation speaker list. Um, so, they, what do you guys think the issue would be here about the speech being? Like, 
explicit in a school. Is that ring in a, why would it be unconstitutional, or why would this person lose their right? There may be a school policy against what kind of speech they may use. Right, very good. Okay, that's gonna be one of the points in the next slide. Okay, so in the district court, I was actually shocked. Um, they found in favor of the student, awarded him damages, and gave him injunctive relief saying, um, you're no longer suspended from the list of you can speak at graduation. He ended up speaking at graduation, um, and then, of course, the school appealed. Um, the appellate Ninth Circuit Court affirmed the district court's decision, and then it was obviously the certiorari, certiorari, <laughs> um, was given, and then they made it to the U.S. Supreme Court. This is where they reversed it. They said, it's inconsistent with fundamental values as the speech did not address political issues. It had nothing to do with um, you know, America's laws or it was inside the school. Um, the school acts as the instrument of the state. So if they were told that you can no longer decide in your own school what's a lewd and vulgar content or act or speech, then an educational mission would then be negated. So they, they're saying if they would have ruled in favor of the student, they're saying, well, the school then just has no control over what, where to draw the line in that matter. Um, there was no diet viol violation of due process, and he had adequate, adequate warning of, hey, you're going to get suspended if you give that speech. So there was no, he couldn't claim, oh, they didn't, you know, they didn't, um, them penalizing me by suspending me was unfair or unconstitutional. And then, last case, Barr versus LaFawn and Blount County School Board in Tennessee, actually just recently, two years ago. Um, this school would have been having a lot of problems with um, fights between black and white students, um, threats on, written on the bathroom stalls and graffiti uh, with hit lists, you know, I'm gonna come kill this person. Um, got into a fight at a basketball game, a parent made a complaint that the African American student that got suspended, it was unfair because the white student get, didn't get suspended at all, um, and then other kind of threats led to a police lockdown. So it got very serious for, um, I believe it was the spring of 2006. Uh, for a while there was a lot, very, nobody come into school because they're all scared and there's a lot of racial tension going on. Um, previously, the school had already strictly enforced and reiterated their dress code every year to their students. They said, we do not want any kind of racially divisive um, symbols on your dress or on your clothing. So they didn't say, we don't want you know, stuff that says you know, bad things about black people. We didn't say, we don't want stuff that says bad things about white people. It was very general. Um, or very specific in the fact of what they didn't want, but very neutral. So the following school year, 23 out of 452 documented dress code violations at the beginning of that year included Confederate flags. So the issue here is um, they said they're just wearing it to represent their Southern heritage. Um, I don't know if they were new students or what, but they did it, you know, they knew the code, they did it anyways, and they were suspended. Um, and then they claimed the three that we talked about at the beginning, your First Amendment, your due process, and your equal protection clauses. So in the district court, um, they were granted, uh, they granted the school board and the principal's um, summary judgment with prejudice to the Blount County School Board. Um, they Was stated- Can't bring it back. Can't bring it back. Um, the images, of the rebel flag obviously disrupted the school atmosphere. It wasn't just necessarily of, well, this doesn't, you know, they couldn't say the Confederate flag, this doesn't mean, I'm not trying to be derogatory charged on anyone. It was already having a problem. They were already causing or having issues with fights and gun threats and other kinds of death threats already. So it was definitely disrupting the atmosphere of the school. Um, the code was narrowly, ta narrowly tailored to a substantial government interest. So I think it was kind of 
not humorous, but that the 14th Amendment is a big issue in this case, and it's coming, you know, it's all coming full circle with the Civil War and the Confederate flag and stuff. Um, it was an issue because it was, it had to do with the United States at one point, I guess that's what I'm trying to say. And then um, they also couldn't prove the due, due process claim because um, they, they had such a strict school pulled that everybody was everybody knew about and then once it appealed in the Sixth Circuit um, they affirmed the decision of the district court and denied the certiorari. certiorari all right so what we need to remember or I guess I'm going to ask you guys and you tell me yes or no and then explain how it would be constitutional if you answered yes or no to this question so does the dress code materially and substantially interfere with appropriate discipline, the rights of others, and the operation of the educational environment? If the answer was yes, what would be the ruling? What would I guess what I'm trying to say? What would be the your decision on would it hold up in court? Would the dress code hold up in court? If it interferes with the rights of others, appropriate discipline and operation of a school atmosphere. Yeah, like it would hold if it did interfere with the rights of oh, others no. okay <laughs> does the dress code interfere okay, with no. the rights of others it would not. no okay good <laughs> sorry that was kind of difficult <laughs> I'm just trying to make this thing all right does the dress code apply to the rights of the students in light of special characteristics of the school environment if it supports the rights of the students is it constitutional? Yes. Okay. Does it attempt to avoid a co controversial or unpopular opinion? Yes. No. no. Okay. Maybe the reason if, if the dress code. code. Maybe that's the okay. If the word. if the dress code attempts to avoid, generally, just they heard about something. I'm just trying to avoid this controversy. Like the armbands. Like the armbands. So that didn't hold up, right? Right. If the dress code remained consistent with fundamental values, is it constitutional? Yes. Yes. <laughs> and is the dress code, if the dress code is related to a substantial government or political viewpoint and causing an issue about that, would it hold up? No, because you're, then you're getting into problems with the United States federal <laughs> problems. All right. Over to Anna. Okay, so now as far as grooming codes, this was another just example that I found online of a grooming code at an elementary school. Um, it didn't specify whether this was a girl's or boy's, so I guess this goes for both sexes. Um, but we'll see lots of these things in the cases. Um, not being excessively full, that makes me just think of hairspray. Tracy turned a lot. Designs are not permitted. Um, we didn't include this case, but we saw in our research a case of a boy with certain hair braids, so maybe something like that. Um, untrimmed sideburns, we'll see extreme hairdos that would be disruptive. It's like a mohawk. Um, no tufts or tails, and then hair comb forward um, that's in your eyes, which we touched on in one of the dress codes. Okay, a background of the culture. Lots of these issues were raised in the 60s and 70s um, where um, think people like the Beatles have popularized styles that were not conducive to these grooming codes in the schools. So just kind of a background of knowing that that was the era is important when you're thinking about these different grooming codes. Okay, the first one is Carr versus Schmidt. It was in Texas in 1972. <coughs> um, this is Chesley Carr. I was able to find a picture of him. He was a 16-year-old male. He had worked all summer on a farm in the Midwest. Um, he attempted to enroll for his junior year at Coronado High School in El Paso, Texas, but was not permitted to do so since he was in violation of the grooming code. Um, his hair is over his ears, it's down close to his face, and it's over his collar. But does, does that look like a lot of our students in school today? Yeah. Beaver hair? Okay. So, um, Carr let his hair grow over his ears and collar because haircuts had not been a high priority when he was working on the farm. Getting a haircut wasn't on the top of the to-do list. So um, 
I thought this was interesting too. He referred to his long hair as a freak flag and believed that it identified him as a supporter of the hippie movement. So he was doing this in a way of um, symbolizing his support of that movement. Um, regardless, you know, the school didn't care. They refused him in minutes and took, so Carr took the school to federal court. Um, this was the code. Does this look familiar to one of the groups? Yeah, that was the code that was in that have. Um, I thought what was really interesting was the beginning. The matter of student grooming is of utmost concern to parents who realize the importance of seeing that children are properly attired when they leave for school each day. Um, it goes on to say um, schools also recognize that parents are basically responsible for their children's dress and general appearance. Um, the role of the school is one of guidance for peoples in an effort for total education and the development of proper attitudes. Um, so that's kind of important in their mission or their rationale for this code is that um, they just want a healthy learning environment. They don't want anyone to be distracted. Um, and then Lindsay read these earlier. Okay, at the federal court, they granted cars injunctive and declaratory relief. Um, they said that um, Chesley must be enrolled in school and that they couldn't enforce that dress code anymore. Um, the school principal sought further review, so it went to the Court of Appeals, who reversed and dismissed the case. Basically, they decided that the freedom or the, con or, let's see, there's no constitutional right to wear one's hair in a public high school in the length and style suited to the wearer. So they're saying your right to wear your hair as you'd like to is not a fundamental fundamental one. It's not constitutional, so um, the dress code as it was could stand. It itself was constitutional. So, moving on. Um, Can I just interject something? Sure. I don't know if any of you read your reading assignment, but if you looked at it, it said that the courts are going to deal with when you're taking someone's right away, is it a fundamental right or is it a non-fundamental right? And fundamental rights is certainly are just those things that are more important, your, your freedom of speech, freedom of speech, your freedom of religion, etc. Is hair length important enough to be considered in that category? Most of us, most of us are saying, at least in that case that we saw, no. Okay. The next was Dunham versus Pulsifer. It was at the same time, 1970-ish in Vermont. Um, okay, this was actually three different boys, Steve Dunham, Prentice Smith, and Paul Weber. They were all tennis players for the high school tennis team, um, and then they all had various accolades. Um, Steve was a senior who was ranked eighth in his class, Prentice was a senior, he was a member of the student council, he was class president, and then the third one, Paul, was a junior and was ranked tenth in his class. Um, so they were all very academically sound, they were well-rounded. Um, they were one, two, and three on the tennis team, so they were very skilled in tennis as well. So, no like discipline problems. They weren't acting out anything like that. Um, on April 16th, the young men were prevented from participating in a tennis match due to their failure to comply with the grooming code for extra class scholastic activities. Um, this one, which group? Remember? Yeah, y'all had that one. So, um, it was a dress code and a grooming code for the athletics. Okay, so the students saw an injunction against the superintendent to bar the enforcement of the school's athletic grooming code. Um, they claimed that the code deprived them of their 14th Amendment right to equal protection of the law. So that was like Katie was saying, obviously it wasn't a racial thing, um, but it was more of them being classified in a certain group and they were being treated differently than other students in the school. Um, the court agreed with them. They said evidence failed to show that the code was necessary in some compelling governmental interest that was the duty of the school authorities to protect or enforce. Okay, so like Dr. Roberts was saying, does that phrase, necessary in some compelling governmental interest, sound familiar from last night's reading? They're referring to that. Does that go for a fundamental or a non-fundamental right? To be a compelling governmental interest. Okay, that's a fundamental right. Okay, so. Okay, but, but go one further than that. For what reason would the school say that we have a compelling interest to make hair length be limited? It's causing a 
times that I'm in school or something like that? It's causing um, problems? Maybe, if there's disruptions. But, uh, you know, if we're talking about athletics, if the hair length is such that it causes some kind of safety problem, would that be? Is safety a compelling governmental interest? Yeah. yeah. Okay, safety certainly would be. Okay, go on. Um, and so the code was deemed unconstitutional. Um, they said, the players said that if their hair was too long, they could wear a headband easily to keep it out of their eyes. Um, they had no discipline issues. It wasn't affecting their teamwork. And so the code was deemed unconstitutional. Okay, so that was opposite of what was said in the Clark case. Um, the last one, Barber versus the Colorado Independent School District. This was more recent. This was in 1994 in Texas. Um, Austin Barber was an 18-year-old high school senior in Colorado City, Texas, and um, he filed a class action suit challenging the legality under the state constitution of hair length and earring restrictions imposed upon male high school students. Um, nobody had this dress and grooming code. Um, what was given was very small, so we didn't elaborate on that. But um, he felt that the school board should not be able to dictate to an adult student matters of hairstyle. So he thought the fact that he was 18 was very important in this case. Additionally, he remarked that he would like to be free from sexual discrimination. So he's also adding that the fact that girls can have longer hair and girls can wear earrings is not fair, since boys cannot. Okay. Grooming code stated that boys may wear hair to the bottom of the collar, the bottom of the ear, and come out of the eyes. Boys may not wear earrings of any kind. So the grooming part is very similar to the other grooming codes that we visited. Um, but the earring is kind of new. Um, it also claimed that its purpose was to teach grooming and hygiene, instill discipline, prevent disruption, avoid safety hazards, and teach respect for authority. I think the most important in that is preventing disruption so that you have um, a good learning environment and then avoiding the safety hazards. Obviously, we know that in sports and in PE, wearing earrings could be dangerous if someone was to um, hit you in the ear and it could um, all right, when it went to trial, the trial court rendered judgment solely on the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, they ruled that the grooming code violated the state constitution and they granted permanent injunction against the defendant, so saying that the, um, those rules could no longer be enforced against him. Um, the school district appealed. In the appellate court, um, the court reversed the trial court decision. They said that Barber's claims do not manifest such an affront to his constitutional rights as to merit our intervention in this case. So this is going back to kind of the car um, findings in that hair length is not a constitutional right. It's not a fundamental right. So the constitutionality is not in question. Um, Barber was not satisfied with this decision, so he appealed it to the state Supreme Court, so the Texas Supreme Court. Um, there they found that while minors do have constitutional rights, they're not the same as adults. Um, the main reasons were the vulnerability of children, their inability to make informed decisions in a mature manner, and the importance of a parental role in child rearing. So the state decided that schools in the state, or schools as the state's agent, um, have more control over the conduct of minors than they do over adults. So they affirmed um, what the appellate court said and ruled that that dress code was constitutional and it did, it was upheld. Okay. So just in summary, um, most of courts agreed that it's a matter of common sense that the state judiciary is less competent to deal with the student's hair length than a parent, school board, administrator, principal, or teacher. So they're pretty much saying that it's not a constitutional right, it shouldn't come to the, to the, um, seat of the judge, it should be decided among um, school personnel. Um, also, what was brought up in a lot of the cases is that grooming is a lot different than dress. Um, if you're not allowed to wear a certain t-shirt that you like at school, you can put that on when you get home. If you can't wear your hair like you'd like to, that's the same at school and at home. It's much more of a permanent change. So um, it's still somewhat debatable whether or not this is a fundamental and constitutional right but it is a lot different than grooming in that permanent nature. Um, so in constructing a grooming code, I just went back to obviously what a reasonable and prudent up-to-date teacher would do. So I just said you should be reasonable and prudent when constructing such policies. Um, 
I don't know, obviously I'm not in the school systems now. Robin or Lindsay, do you know if y'all's school has a grooming policy? It doesn't seem like it, just the way that kids are wearing their hair nowadays. But obviously in PE, we would, we would want, like Amanda said, it would be a safety thing. If there was an issue with it being in their eyes where they couldn't see to participate or wearing jewelry, um, that would be important. And we have one other. This. If something ever goes to court, if you create a policy that affects their attire, affects their money, et cetera, have a good reason for it, justify it well. Because if it's related to, um, to the health of the student, to the safety of the student, to preventing um, disruptive behavior among students, Sometimes oh, they're okay with it promoting better discipline or even better sportsmanship and team spirit. But the stronger you can make your case for having the rule, the better off you are. Because that's what courts are looking at. Why is this rule necessary? Okay. Go ahead. Okay. So we have one more um, case that's strictly applicable to, or more applicable to this question. We found, uh, yeah, so just so you guys have kind of a, in our own setting relation. Um, this uh, PE teacher allowed his students to participate barefoot because he didn't have the proper um, shoes to participate in the first place. So he said, take your shoes off and you can go uh, participate then. Well, obviously, little William tripped, fell, and hurt his feet. Um, and the parents, of course, are going to be plaintiffs in this case on a negligence and would anyone like to raise their hand and tell me what duty the teacher, physical education teacher failed to? Is that? Proper instruction. Proper instruction, okay. You said it's okay if you don't wear your shoes, right? Anything else? Proper. Liz? Proper. Proper equipment, okay. You have to have tennis shoes and PE class. Very good. Which is related to the duty to provide a safe environment. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. All right. Um, and do you think, being in this class after all the cases we've heard, do you think this is a foreseeable risk to let someone go run barefoot? Okay, great. Okay, so our next activity, we want you to get back in the groups that you were in earlier. Um, Katie's going to bring around these little grab bags. Um, you can open them. In them are different hairstyles and attire, pieces of attire. I want you to go through and pick out, sort which ones you think would be um, acceptable and inacceptable in the schools, and then be prepared to explain why based on what you've learned so far. Katie and I will circulate if you have questions on what something actually is. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you like them? Oh. Do you have any questions and the about piercings, what it is? What, what about Uggs? Uh, uh, they say they're not safe. No. No. But his hair is in his eyes are still peeping out. Oh, yeah. If Robin, if you're a pee. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah, you could explain it. it. Whether we're what do you guys not? think? It looks like his eyes. Is that your appropriate and inappropriate? Right. So I said this is What about if we were in PE? Ugg boots. Okay. No, I'm just asking in general. And then we'll say. And then we'll say. Okay, is everybody kind of ready to present? This group had a good question. Is this for a general dress code or specific to PE? Let's address it first generally, and then you can tell me if you have any differences if you were in the PE environment. So we'll start with your group. Um, in 
these are unacceptable. Kind of hold them up. Well, you insert the T-shirt and it says drugs suck. And then, um, <laughs> okay. Why is drugs suck not appropriate? The word suck. Right. The, word. <laughs> the connotation. Okay. The rebel flag. And we thought this skirt was too short. <laughs> okay. Very good. Very good. <laughs> Uh, generally acceptable. We we found this guy's earring generally acceptable, um, along along with his facial hair, his sideburns, and long goatee. Um, pants. These pants capris. They're great. Um, Uggs. We wish they were out, yeah, but they're it's not. fine. <laughs> so that was what we thought for a general setting. But in PE, the Uggs would not be acceptable, nor would the earring. And I would say maybe the hair. If he can't see, then it is probably just safe to go with it. Talk about the other guy? Yeah, this guy. <laughs> this I, I, don't, I don't know if you can see or not. So. Okay. Andrea, what about your group? Acceptable. Even though I don't like the logo. Acceptable. Paper hair. <laughs> Questionable. He has a scruffy face. Wow. And then we thought the chains on the pants were unacceptable. This uh, mohawk guy and the crochet back shirt. <laughs> crochet back shirt. <laughs> <laughs> the dress. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Very good. Um, we had cut off jeans. <laughs> Unacceptable. Swastika shirt. <laughs> Smoking blows. Unacceptable. We said pink haired lady. Um, we have beaver hair is acceptable. And regular pants, catching. And then Uggs, but not acceptable. Right. Okay. So, this is pretty much. I don't, I don't agree with that. Which one? Like, no, no. Yeah, we. <laughs> <laughs> she also has a nose. But it's not it. this. I mean, it's not that. But you can tell it not want to color the hair. Like, what about red and have that bright on hair? Oh, but you can change that. But I mean, well, I mean no, to me, telling them that they can't cut their hair is something they can change. Definitely dyeing it hot pink is to me would be disturbing in a classroom. But that can Stretch. change more quickly than the length of somebody's hair can change. I know, so then they don't have to I, I think they have the right to have whatever color hair they want to. Who's to say that blonde hair and brown and brunette are the only three colors? I mean, blonde, brunette, red hair are the only three. And you have to I think that's just really red. Because I, I, I mean, I go black and blonde sometimes, and people think that's a stern, but I don't care. So, <laughs> so <laughs> if a girl wore bright pink hair, was told she needed to change it, refused, they expelled her, she took it to court. She what are the courts going to be looking at in making a decision? Is it under a safety concern? Is okay, it what is the reason for the rule that says you can't have pink hair? What's the basis for making that rule? It's a distraction. It's a learning environment, that's what I would think. I would say that's a distraction. I guarantee you, if one of us came up in this room with pink right hair, I'd look at it and I'd say, "Give me more hair." And then I'd be over it. They don't want people. But in younger kids, you're like younger kids. You have to be scared. And one of the things that's true is we don't know for sure what the courts would say, so we have to sit down around the table if we're a school board or somebody developing a policy and discuss it including what experiences we've had with different hair colors in the past and whether it influenced behavior or whether it turned out to be a non-issue. Because they will be looking at that. Has this caused problems in the school before? What's the history here? Okay, But we maybe not, won't know the answer to this question until the courts have such a case. Right, because obviously the grooming cases that we looked at had mixed opinions. Some upheld it and some did not, so it's hard to know. All right, so all we have left are our kind of recommendations. Um, first of all, we said rules and regulations should be established to enhance a positive learning environment. That's what we were just talking. It shouldn't be. Uh, no student's hair dress should be distracting to the others. Um, 
positive and safe. I'm gonna add, I would just add. <laughs> Here we go. We're gonna, I want to write it. Oh, oh no. no. Oh, no. <laughs> what the heck? Oh. But again, because it goes back to the reason and safety is compelling interest of the schools, that, that's why I emphasize that one. Okay. Um, also, um, like the last case said, the Barber case, since minors have different constitutional rights, the school represents a unique setting. So um, a quote that we really liked was that you need to secure individual rights without infringing, infringing on the rights of others. So that's an important quotation to remember. Sure. And that goes back to the um, free speech where the, the kid was giving sexually explicit speech um, in the fact that there are still minors in your audience and you don't send your kids to school to have um, just to ever talk about whatever, and it obviously made a lot of the students uncomfortable when he was saying those things. So that's another issue of school as a unique environment. Um, like we were saying, a lot of it today, um, compared to the 1970s, like with the hair, has changed a lot. We see little kids running around all the time today with longer, hair, like boys with longer hair now. Um, um, so just be prudent and reasonable when you, and seek a compromise before you start and always let them know what the code is or what the rules are before you start. Um, we do need to make exceptions for religious practices. Obviously, people have headdresses or the um, different garb that they wear. So um, have exceptions for that in your code. And then um, always be reasonable and narrowly or narrowly define your um, reasoning behind a certain um, rule or code or banning, like they said about the racially divisive clothing. This is the main point to remember throughout all of it. Have freedom without disruption. So. And here's um, just for you guys' records to keep, just like a brief overview of our presentation and the high points that you need to remember when Referring to dress and grooming. All right, let me ask one follow up question here. The, um, the landmark case in this was the Tinker versus Des Moines, which is the armband case. And in that case, they, you heard the statement. Teachers and students don't shed their constitutional right to speak and expression at the schoolhouse gate. And that may be a surprising thing to go back and read, given the fact that in the schools now we're seeing all kinds of things you can't wear on your t-shirts or headbands or all kinds of things, all kinds of emblems, etc. What's the rationale for restricting that freedom as much as we are um, in modern times? Why couldn't they wear a swastika? Why couldn't they wear a gang-related symbol? Why couldn't they wear? This whole thing about the causing disturbances, and that's not just disrupting learning. That becomes a safety issue, also, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So the prevalence of gangs, in particular areas of the country, in particular, and in urban areas. I mean, rural urban areas in particular, not rural, urban areas in particular, where there's high gang activity, you're going to find more schools with more rules prohibiting what students can wear because they're looking at the history of activity in those areas. So, all right, Thursday we will be back here again for main day. Or, pardon? For main day. For lesson on drug testing. And then we'll continue with some of our other uh, presentations. Which we left out our numbers. It was Anna. You left out what? Drug testing. Drug testing. Oh, right. We didn't mention it. Drug testing is a part of surgery. Did you know if you read your homework? That's right. Yes. Thank you. That's why I was letting them do that. I said, yes, we have a homework. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah.